Endgame. While Americans celebrated victory, a woman in her early 30s, with short, dark hair, stepped off a train in the tiny town of Las Vegas, New Mexico. She walked to a boarding house and asked for a room, explaining to the clerk that she suffered from tuberculosis and that her doctor had told her to spend some time breathing dry desert air. Actually, Lona Cohen was perfectly healthy. She was an experienced spy and courier for KGB agents in New York, and she was in New Mexico to meet Ted Hall. Stalin was screaming for the bomb, and Soviet scientists still needed more information from Los Alamos. They needed final reports on how the atomic bombs had been made. A meeting had already been arranged with Hall, but Anatoly Yatskov decided not to use Hall's friend Saville Sachs as a courier. This mission was too important to trust to an amateur. On the first Sunday after arriving in New Mexico, Lona Cohen took a three-hour bus ride to Albuquerque and walked across the University of New Mexico campus to the spot where she was to meet Hall. She had seen a photo of him, so she knew what to look for. He wasn't there. Training... Trained not to wait more than five minutes, she walked back to the bus stop and returned to Las Vegas. Both Cohen and Hall had been told that, if either missed the first meeting, they should try again the next Sunday at the same time and place. Cohen returned the following Sunday. No Hall. She came back the week after. He didn't show. At Los Alamos, the British team of scientists began packing up to head home. Before leaving, they scheduled one last party to honor in honor of their American hosts, Someone needed to drive to Santa Fe to pick up the liquor. Klaus Fuchs volunteered. He drove his dented Buick through the gates and down the hill. I stopped somewhere on the way in the desert, he remembered, and drove off the highway to a solitary place. Fuchs took out a pen and a half-written report. Sitting in his car, he quickly finished the paper, which included vital details on plutonium bomb design, as well as a technical description of the uranium bomb used at Hiroshima. He shoved the papers into an envelope and drove to the liquor store. At about six that evening, Harry Gold was standing on the side of a small road on the outskirts of Santa Fe. When Fuchs drove up, Gold hopped into the passenger seat. We drove out into the mountains beyond Santa Fe, Gold reported. He could hear the clinking of glass bottles in the back seat. Fuchs pulled over. He was very nervous, Gold remembered, and I was inwardly not too calm myself. Well, Fuchs began his face twisted into an uneasy smile. Were you impressed? More than impressed, said Gold. Horrified. Fuchs understood. The bombs had been even more devastating than he had expected. For the first time in their many meetings, Fuchs talked nonstop. He talked about the shocking sight at Trinity, the chilling reports from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He just had to talk. He himself was rather awestricken by what had occurred, remembered Gold greatly concerned by the terrible destruction which the weapon had wrought. They watched the sky darken, the lights come on in town. Fuchs suggested that someday, maybe, they would meet again. We openly meet openly as friends, he said, and speak of music and other matters, but not speak of war. Gold said he hoped this would happen. Finally, Fuchs handed Gold the papers he had prepared, then Fuchs drove Gold to the bus station. They shook hands and Gold got out. After a period of anxious waiting, he said, about an hour and a half, I finally obtained a bus going back to Albuquerque. Ted Hall was aware he'd missed meetings with the Soviet courier assigned to pick up his final report. He'd been un unable to get away from his work at Los Alamos. Finally, a month after Lona Cohen arrived in New Mexico, Hall spent a quiet Sunday morning in his office, preparing the promised papers. Knowing his lab partner, Philip Kudz, was going on a picnic that day. Hall expected to be alone. He spread top-secret bomb plans on his desk so he could refer to them as he wrote up his report. The door swung open. Panicking, Hall clumsily slept, swept the papers into his desk drawer as Kuntz stepped in. If the man had come over to see what, what Hall was doing, there would have been no possible explanation. Hall got lucky. Kuntz felt guilty that he was taking time off while his partner was spending Sunday in the office. He said a quick goodbye and ducked out. Later that day, Hall took a bus to the University of New Mexico campus. He'd been told to look for a woman with a magazine poking out of her purse. She would answer to the name Helen. The woman with the magazine was there. When she spotted Hall, she walked up and introduced herself. They strolled together for a few minutes, like old friends. Cohen quietly cautioned Hall that he was taking a huge risk in helping the Soviets. 
things might turn out pretty hot, she said. Hall assured Cohen he knew of the danger. If American agents were ever on Hall's trail, Cohen said, the KGB had told her to help arrange his transport to the Soviet Union, where he'd be given a new life. Hall said he very much hoped that would not be necessary. Then he handed his papers to Cohen, and they parted. Cohen took the bus back to her boarding house. She pulled the tissues out of a nearly full tissue box, crammed Hall's secret papers in the bottom of the box, placed the tissues, grabbed her already packed suitcase, and left. Minutes later, she stepped into the train station. The place was crawling with soldiers and FBI agents. They were searching all passengers coming in and going out. Since the war ended, newspapers had been free to tell the public that the atomic bomb had been built by scientists at Los Alamos, led by Robert Oppenheimer. The government was determined to protect Oppenheimer and his staff, and their bomb-making making secrets. Cohen's tissue box held Hall's handwritten report with detailed plans and sketches of an atomic bomb. It was more than enough evidence to get her and Hall executed for spying. She was too well-trained to panic. Rushing out of the station would be the surest way to draw attention. Instead, she set down her bag and, glancing around casually, took a few minutes to focus her mind on the character she'd invented, a friendly, absent-minded tuberculosis patient on her way home from the desert. When her train was nearly done boarding, Cohen stepped up to the track with her suitcase in one hand, her purse over her shoulder, a box of tissues in her other hand. An FBI agent asked to see her ticket and look in her bags. Another began questioning her about her business in New Mexico. While answering, Cohen opened her purse and fumbled through the contents. No ticket. She laughed aloud at herself for misplacing it. She kneeled down to open her suitcase, but couldn't work the zipper with the box of tissues in her hand. The train whistle blew. Over the loudspeaker came the all aboard announcement. Her train was about to leave. Smiling, she passed the tissues to the government agent. Her hands free, she opened the suitcase, rummaged, and found the ticket. The agents had a look of, at the contents of her bag. They nodded and gestured for her to get going. She zipped up the bag, lifted her purse, and stepped up onto the train. Without the tissues. I felt in my bones that the gentleman himself must remind me about this box, she later said. As the train began rolling, Cohen heard the FBI agent call to her. She turned around. He handed her the box of tissues through the open door. It was the one thing he hadn't searched. Harry Gold returned safely to New York City with the report from Klaus Fuchs. Lona Cohen came back with the report from Ted Hall. In separate meetings, both delivered their papers to the Soviet contact Anatoly Yatskov. Leonid Vaznikov, who ran the KGB office in New York City, compared the documents from Fuchs and Hall. Both contained thorough reports on atomic bomb design. I made a conclusion, he said, that I myself, although I was not very good craftsman, could have built a bomb with this data, if I had certain materials, of course. The best thing about the reports, Gaznikov knew, was that the bomb plans from both Hall and Fuchs were nearly identical. That convinced the Soviets the information was correct, allowing them to move ahead quickly with bomb building. No need for the kind of costly trial and error that had taken place at Los Alamos. By October, KGB officers in Moscow were able to produce a complete report on plutonium bomb design, containing detailed descriptions of each component of the weapon and specific materials needed. Using this, Soviet scientists immediately began building their first atomic weapon. It was an exact copy of the American bomb. Father of the Bomb Soon after Japan's surrender, Robin Oppenheimer got on a train and headed east. He was a nervous wreck, a fellow passenger observed. Oppenheimer kept looking under the table and all around. Everyone knew Oppenheimer now. His name was spread across newspaper headlines. His bony face and intense eyes started out from magazine covers. The press was calling him the father of the atomic bomb, a new kind of superhero. Superman relied on his enormous physical strength. Oppenheimer could let loose the energy locked inside atoms. Oppenheimer was torn by the attention. He relished the fame, but was terrified by the thought of what he had helped to create, a world with atomic weapons. If you ask... Can we, make them more, can we make them more terrible? The answer is yes, Oppenheimer told a reporter. 
If you ask, can we make a lot of them? The answer is yes. This is what he was hoping to prevent. Oppenheimer got off the train in Washington, D.C., carrying a report with his recommendations for the future. Physicists would certainly design more powerful atomic bombs, he argued. But would that necessarily make the country safer? No, because other countries could also build bombs, and there would be no way to ensure that those bombs weren't used on Americans. The safety of this nation, he insisted, cannot lie wholly or even primarily in its scientific or technical prowess. It can be based only on making future wars impossible. The only hope, he believed, was for the United States to stop building bombs and to somehow convince the Soviet Union not to start. Truman Secretary of State James Burns replied that neither goal was realistic. Burns returned Oppenheimer's report with a message for its author. Tell Dr. Oppenheimer for the time being his proposal about international agreement is not practical and that he and the rest of the gang should pursue their work full force. In other words, he wanted Oppenheimer to get back to the lab and build more bombs. That's what Leslie Groves expected, too. If things moved according to schedule, he reported, the U.S. Army would have 20 plutonium bombs by the end of 1945. Oppenheimer returned to Los Alamos, feeling what he described to a friend as a profound grief and a profound perplexity about the course we should be following. At the lab, Edward Teller showed him a design for a far more powerful atomic weapon. He wanted Oppenheimer to get help government support for the new bomb. I neither can nor will do so, Oppenheimer told Teller. It was obvious, Teller said later, that Oppenheimer did not want to support further weapons work in any way. That was a common feeling among the bomb makers. We all felt like, like the soldiers we had done for our, our duty, said Hans Baith and that we deserve to return to the type of work that we had chosen as our life's career, the pursuit of pure science and teaching. On October 16, 1945, Oppenheimer officially resigned as director of Los Alamos. A ceremony was planned, and Dorothy McKibben drove from her office in Santa Fe up to the hill to attend. It was a sunny fall day. McKibben saw thousands gathering in front of an outdoor stage. Beside the stage, she saw Oppenheimer pacing, Hello, she said. He walked right by her. His eyes were glazed over, she remembered, the way they were when he was in deep thought. On stage a few minutes later, Leslie Groves handed Oppenheimer a scroll, a certi certificate of thanks from the government to Oppenheimer and the Los Alamos staff. It is our hope that in the years to come, we may look at this scroll and all that it signifies with pride, Oppenheimer told the crowd. Today, that pride must be tempered with a profound concern, he continued. If atomic bombs are to be added as new weapons to the arsenal of a warring world or to the arsenals of nations preparing for war, then the time will come when mankind will curse the names of Los Alamos and Hiroshima. The peoples of this world must unite or they will perish. A week later, Oppenheimer was back in Washington to continue his talks with top officials. Early on the morning of October 24th, he walked the streets of the Capitol with Henry Wallace, the Secretary of Commerce. I never saw a man in such an extremely nervous state as Oppenheimer, Wallace wrote in his diary that night. He seemed to feel that the destruction of the entire human race was imminent. Oppenheimer complained that Secretary of State Burns didn't seem to understand the implications of the bomb. Bar Burns seemed to think that it could be used like a pistol to scare the Soviets into behaving a certain way. Oppenheimer believes that this method will not work, wrote Wallace. He says the Russians are a proud people and have good physicists and abundant resources. They may have to lower their standard of living to do it, but they will put everything they have into getting plenty of atomic bombs as soon as possible. At that point, the United States and Soviet Union would be in an arms race, each trying to produce weapons fast enough to stay ahead. Oppenheimer believed this race could still be prevented, do you think it would do any good to see the president? Oppenheimer asked. Yes, said Wallace. The next morning, at 10.30, Oppenheimer walked into the Oval Office. President Truman was at his desk. He stood and shook Oppenheimer's hand. This was their first meeting. They sat and began to talk. The conversation started awkwardly. 
Truman wanted to discuss how scientists and the military could continue working together to make more atomic bombs, while Oppenheimer trying to steer the conversation to the topic of international cooperation and the goal of stopping the arms race before it could begin. Truman brushed this worry aside, asking, When will the Russians be able to build the bomb? I don't know, Oppenheimer answered. I know. When? Never. Oppenheimer was stunned by Truman's confidence. Unjustified confidence, Oppenheimer believed. He had planned to lay out his step-by-step -step strategy, strategy for preventing an arms race, backing each step with clearly reasoned arguments. But at this critical moment, he was too emotional to command his powers of persuasion. He lifted his trembling hands in front of Truman. Mr. President, he said, I feel I have blood on my hands. Truman's eyes flashed disgust. Never mind, he mumbled. It'll all come out in the wash. If Truman had any misgivings about using the atomic bomb, he kept them well buried. A long silence followed. Then the president stood. The meeting was over. Don't worry, Truman told Oppenheimer as they shook hands. We're going to work something out, and you're going to help us. Oppenheimer left the room. Blood on his hands, damn it, Truman grumbled as he shut the door. He hasn't half as much blood on his hands as I have. You don't just go around bellyaching about it. When aides came in to discuss other business, Truman snapped, I don't want to see that son of a bitch in this office ever again. Outside the Oval Office, Oppenheimer put on his hat and coat. He walked through the halls and out of the White House and toward the street. He was the father of the atomic bomb, but at that moment, he knew his creation was completely and forever beyond his control. Fallout One summer day, three years after the end of World War II, Harry Gold fell in love. It really happened, so just like that, he said. Here was this girl I'd been searching for all my life. The woman was Mary Lanning, a fellow chemist. She and Gold began dating, and Gold became more and more convinced that this was his shot at happiness. Why not grab it? The war was long since over. Klaus Fuchs was back in Britain. Gold was working in a hospital lab in Philadelphia, with no access to valuable secrets and no interest in spying ever again. Why not just live a normal life? It was wishful thinking, and Gold knew it. Mary had no idea what was wrong, but she sensed a disturbing coolness in her boyfriend. Here was a man who was kind and generous. He said he loved her, and yet he always seemed distracted. When Gold asked Lanning to marry him, she hesitated. If he really loved her, she wondered, why lack the, pa why the lack of passion? It wasn't lack of passion she was sensing. It was fear. Gold later admitted, and fear not for myself, but a horror at the thought that the disastrous revelation might come after we had been married for three or four years with children at home of our own. Gold could confess, tell her everything. She might stick by him. But the basic, basic problem remained. For most of his adult life, Harry Gold had been a spy for the Soviet Union. Was it really possible to get away with something like that? Who knew better than I on what precarious, tottering house of cards my whole life rested? On a wet gray morning on the plains of Kazakhstan, 2,000 miles east of Moscow, Igor Kurchikotov paced back and forth in a small concrete bunker. Well, well, muttered the head of the Soviet bomb project. Well, well. It was a few minutes before 6 a.m. on August 29, 1949. Outside Kurchikotov's bunker, the tall grass bent in the wind. Six miles away, a steel tower rose 100 feet above the flat land. On a platform at the top of the tower sat the Soviet Union's first atomic bomb. Zero minus ten minutes. The countdown echoed off the bunker's concrete walls. Kurkachev continued walking and muttering. Crowded into the bunker were the other top Soviet physicists, along with the head of Stalin's secret police, Lavrenti Beria. Beria watched Kurkachev's nervous pacing. He decided to crank up the pressure. Nothing will come of it, Igor, Beria jabbed. Kurkachev shook his head. We'll certainly get it, he insisted. 
For weeks, the Soviet scientists had been privately discussing what would happen if this bomb test failed. Many expected to be shot. The countdown hit ten seconds, then five, four, three, two, one, and then... On top of the tower, an unbearably bright light blazed up, one of the Soviet physicists recalled. The white fireball engulfed the tower, and expanding rapidly, changing color, it rushed upwards. The bomb was an exact copy of the American implosion bomb tested at Trinity, and the rising, twisting, pulsing ball of fire looked just the same. The steel tower was vaporized. Tanks placed around the tower to test the bomb's strength were tossed into the air. As he watched the bomb's glow brighten, low hills in the distance, Kirkachev was hit by the same emotion that had swept over Oppenheimer at Trinity. Trinity. Pure relief. And his first words were identical. It worked. A much more excited Lavrenti Beria hugged and kissed Kirkachev, and then ran to the phone and shouted for an immediate connection to Stalin's home. Stalin's secretary picked up in Moscow, where it was two hours earlier. He explained to Beria that the Soviet leader was still asleep. Beria said, Wake him up. The Soviet Union's first atomic bomb exploded with the force of 20,000 tons of TNT. It was too big to hide. Just a few days later, a U.S. Air Force weather plane flying over the western Pacific detected high levels of radiation in the air. Air samples were collected and sent to labs for study. In Washington, D.C., a panel of scientists, including Robert Oppenheimer, analyzed the results. They were quickly convinced that an atomic bomb had exploded somewhere in the Soviet Union, probably on the morning of August 29th. Oppenheimer was not surprised. Just a few months before, he told a reporter, our atomic monopoly is like a cake of ice melting in the sun. But President Harry Truman was stunned. His intelligence experts had just told him the Soviets wouldn't have the bomb until the middle of 1953. How had they built an atomic bomb so quickly? An FBI counterintelligence agent named Robert Lamphier asked him himself the same question. Had the Russian scientists actually been several years ahead of our estimates of their progress? Lamphier wondered. Or had they been aided in their effort to build it by information stolen from the United States? The answer lay in a stack of coded telegrams sent from America by Soviet agents during World War II. While in the United States, Soviet spies had to use the American Telegraph Company to send information quickly back to Moscow. The KGB probably knew that the Telegraph Company was making copies of every telegram and handing them over to the U.S. Army. This didn't particularly worry the Soviets. Messages were always written in an extremely complex code. In 1949, after years of failure, American code breakers cracked the code. Intelligence agents began decoding all the messages sent to the Soviet Union during the war. That's when they came across a shocking note sent from New York City to KGB headquarters in 1944. In this cable were data and theories that seemed to have come directly from inside the Manhattan Project, Lampier explained. When I read the KGB message, it became immediately obvious to me that the Russians had indeed stolen crucial, crucial research from us and had undoubtedly used it to build their bomb. The 1944 telegram summarized a top-secret scientific paper. The paper had been written by one of the British scientists working with Oppenheimer. A few phone calls later, Lampier had the name of the, of the paper's author, Klaus Fuchs. Lampier notified the agents of MI5, Britain's military intelligence agency. After the war, Fuchs had returned to Britain and continued working for the government. By 1949, he'd risen to the head of the Theoretical Physics Division at Harwell, Britain's main atomic research center. One morning, shortly after the Soviet bomb test, a tall, thin man stepped into Fuchs's office. He identified himself as William Scarden, an investigator with MI5, and said he was just doing a routine check. Puffing on a pipe, Scarden asked Fuchs a long series of questions about the scientist's background and family. After 75 minutes of friendly chatter, Scarden said, said, said suddenly, Were you not in touch with a Soviet official or a Soviet representative while you were in New York? And did you not pass on information to that person about your work? There was a long silence. Fuchs sat perfectly still. Even his face remained frozen. 
Finally, he said, I don't think so. At that moment, Scard Scardin knew the man was guilty. But he had no evidence. The coded Soviet telegrams couldn't be used in a public court because the Americans didn't want the Soviets to know that they'd broken their code. Sure, Books had been a communist back in his college days, but that was hardly proof he was a Soviet spy. Scardin repeated the charge anyway, just to get a reaction. I don't understand, Fuchs said. Perhaps you will tell me what the evidence is. Scardin declined, moved on to other subjects, and said a polite goodbye. He questioned Fuchs several more times over the next few weeks. Fuchs continued to deny everything, though the pressure was getting to him. At home, alone at night, he considered suicide. On January 22, 1950, Fuchs called Scardin. He said he wanted to talk. Scardin came to Fuchs's house. You asked to see me, and here I am, the investigator said. Yes, said Fuchs. It's rather up to me now. When did it start? asked Scardin. It started in 1942. Tell me, uh, just to give me a better picture, what was the most important information you passed over? Perhaps the most important thing was the full design of the atomic bomb. Harry Gold's fear of exposure had ruined his relationship with Mary Lanning. Alone again, he tried to focus on his job, always wondering when his house of cards would come crashing down. When he read newspaper accounts of the arrest of Klaus Fuchs in Britain, he knew it would be soon. On Monday, May 15, 1950, FBI agents Scott Miller and Richard Brennan came to the Philadelphia Hospital Lab where Gold worked. Even before they showed me their identification, I knew who they were, Gold recalled. The agents asked Gold to come down to the bureau offices to ask, answer a few questions. They were curious about men Gold had worked with during the war, and, they added, some other matters. Gold was questioned for five hours that night, but the questions were general. There was no accusation of spying. On Tuesday, he noticed two men in suits following him. On Wednesday, while he was at work, an agent poked his head into the lab. I thought I'd stop in and see what your place was like, the man said with a smile. Gold showed the agent around. They chatted politely, but the mood was tense. Both were pretending that this was just a friendly visit, but knew it wasn't. I'm under surveillance, Gold kept thinking. Why? What do they know? Agents Miller and Brennan brought Gold to FBI offices for questioning again on Thursday, but they didn't accuse him of anything. Not yet. Then, after a nine-hour session on Friday night, Brennan handed Gold a photograph. Do you know who he is? Gold looked at the photo. It was the pale, sad, owl-like face of Klaus Fuchs. I do not know him, Gold said desperately trying to sound calm. I recognize the picture as that of Dr. Fuchs, uh, the Briton who got in trouble over there, but I don't know him. I've never been to England. Ah, yes, you know him. You met him in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Never been there in my life. As with Fuchs, the agents had no proof that Gold was a spy. Fuchs had described Gold's appearance, but didn't know Gold's real name. Fuchs also had investigators, had also told investigators that his American contact seemed to know a lot about chemistry, but that was hardly evidence. The FBI needed to force Gold to confess, or they had no case. That was why they were keeping him under constant surveillance and conducting late-night interrogations. The agents were hoping to wear Gold down, to confuse him, and make him lose hope. It was working. After two more long interviews on Saturday and Sunday, the agents mentioned that they could settle the matter once and for all by taking a quick look in Gold's house. Gold had the legal right to refuse, but decided there was no point. What would happen uh, would happen, and that was all, he later said of his thinking at this critical moment. Possibly it was the sheer and utter exhaustion of that past week which had produced this reaction in me. The next morning, May 22nd, Gold ate breakfast at his home with his brother and father. When they put on their coats to leave for work, Gold was still in his pajamas. I have to work home today, he told them. He said goodbye, and they left. Gold looked at the clock. The FBI would be there any moment. 
shaking off his fatigue, Gold decided to make use of what little time remained. He started quickly up the stairs to his bedroom. He had a few more minutes to destroy 17 years of evidence. Epilogue. Scorpions and a Bottle. Klaus Fuchs made a complete confession and was taken to prison in London to await trial. When friends came to visit, Fuchs tried to explain how he had divided his brain into two compartments, one for his commitment to communism and one for his personal life. His main regret, he said, was that his secret mission had caused him to lie to his friends. You don't know what I had done to my own mind, Fuchs said. On the morning before his trial, Fuchs met with his lawyer in a prison cell beneath the courthouse. The lawyer, Derek Curtis Bennett, warned Fuchs to brace himself. He was likely to be given the maximum penalty allowed by law. You know what that is? Curtis Bennett asked. Yes, said Fuchs. It's death. No, you bloody fool, it's fourteen years. Fuchs was confused. You didn't give any secrets to an enemy, the lawyer said. You gave them to an ally. During World War II, Britain and the Soviet Union had been fighting on the same side. In the eyes of British law, Curtis Bennett explained, that made all the difference. If Fuchs had committed treason to help an enemy, he'd face the death penalty. But the maximum sentence for passing secrets to an ally was 14 years in prison. After a trial lasting just two hours, Fuchs was given 14 years. He was released from prison in 1959, thanks to a reduction in sentence for good behavior. He moved to communist East Germany, where he got married, and continued atomic research. Fuchs died in 1988, at the age of 76. As soon as the FBI found incriminating papers in his bedroom, Harry Gold cracked wide open. Seventeen years of secrets came pouring out. Every time you squeeze him, there is some juice left, said one of the interrogators, interrogating agents. Here's where the huge mistake made five years before by the KGB came back to bite them. When Gold went to New Mexico in June 1945, he had orders from his KGB handler, Anatoly Yatskov, to pick up information from both Klaus Fuchs and a second source, David Greenglass. By doing this, Gold cross-contaminated two separate spy rings. He learned about and was therefore capable of exposing two different operations. And that's exactly what happened. Gold told the FBI about Greenglass, who was arrested, arrested and questioned. Greenglass identified the people who had recruited him to spy for the Soviets, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. In the most famous espionage trial of the century, the Rosenbergs were found guilty of helping to pass vital national secrets to the Soviets. They were sentenced to death. Under American law, the fact that the Soviets were not enemies at the time the information was exchanged did not save them. The trial exposed the names of Soviet agents, and many had to flee the country. The KGB continued to spy on America, of course, but they were never again as effective as they had been during World War II. Gold's confession and the Rosenberg trial also helped ignite the Red Scare of the 1950s, an obsessive hunt for communists everywhere in American society. Gold watched it all from his jail cell. By cooperating with authorities, he had avoided the electric chair, getting a 30-year sentence instead. I am calm, he said during his prison term, and my mind is at peace for the first time in more than a decade and a half. Gold was paroled from prison in 1965, he returned home to Philadelphia, where he died in 1972, at the age of 61. Ted Hall was the one who got away. After the war, Hall decided to return to school and began working toward his Ph.D. in physics at the University of Chicago. There, he met and fell in love with a student named Joan. Hall's approach was different from Gold's. Rather than live with secrets, he took Joan to her bedroom and shut the door. He looked around the small room nervously. You don't have any microphones in here, do you? He asked. She assured him that she didn't. They sat on the bed. Ted told her everything. They were married soon after. Three years later, the army code breakers who had exposed Klaus Fuchs found another curious telegram sent to KGB headquarters during World War II. It had been sent from New York City to Moscow in late 1944. 
The message described Ted Hall's meeting with the Soviet journalist and agent Sergei Kurnikov at Kurnikov's New York apartment, the meeting at which the 19-year-old Hall had first offered himself as a spy. The information was passed on to the FBI's Chicago office. On March 16, 1951, Agent Robert McQueen dropped by Hall's lab at the university. He said he needed Hall's help with a matter pertaining to the security of the United States. Hall agreed to come to McQueen's office to answer a few questions. The moment he began questioning Hall, McQueen knew he'd met his match. I think he was very bright, McQueen recalled. Very, very bright. Expecting this day to come, Hall had long ago prepared his story. When McQueen pulled out a photo of Sergei Kurnikov, Hall calmly said he knew of Kurnikov's articles, but had never met the man. Hour after hour, the questions grew more intense. McQueen finally came out and accused Hall of spying. Hall seemed confused by the charge, but not greatly upset. Quite calm for his age, McQueen noted. Too calm, the agent thought. An innocent man usually says, Why are you asking me these questions? Hall never protested. He answered the questions, then got up to leave. McQueen asked if he'd be willing to come back for another interview. No, said Hall. He had nothing more to say. The FBI knew Hall was guilty, and Hall knew they knew. But all the government had on Hall was the decoded KGB cable, and they didn't want to use that in court. Hall guessed this was the case. He simply refused to talk with the FBI, and they had no legal way to force him. That didn't stop FBI agents from opening Hall's mail and tapping his home phone and following him everywhere. We knew that there was a definite chance that the world was going to collapse around us, Joan Hall remembered. She and Ted lived in fear for a couple of years, but slowly, over time, the FBI gave up. In 1962, the Halls, with their three young children, moved to Britain, where Hall went to, a work, went to work in a lab at Cambridge University. It was not until 1995, when the KGB's decoded messages, messages were finally made public, that Hall was exposed. When reporters came to his house to question him, he admitted contact with Soviet agents, but declined to discuss details. If confronted with the same problem today, Hall acknowledged, I would respond quite differently. Ted Hall lived another four years, dying at the age of 74. After leaving Los Alamos, Robert Oppenheimer moved east, taking over as director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. He also continued working in Washington, D.C., where he served as a scientific advisor to the government on atomic energy policy. That's where he got in trouble. The Soviet bomb test in 1949 seriously intensified the Cold War, the growing global rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union that followed World War II. The United States faced a major decision. Now that the Soviets had the atomic bomb, should the Americans try to build an even more devastating weapon? While working at Los Alamos, Oppenheimer and the other two top, scienti and the other top scientists had discussed the possibility of building what they called the super. This would be a new kind of bomb, not based on splitting atoms. The super would get its energy from fusion, or the joining of atoms. At the extreme temperatures and pressures inside the sun and other stars, hydrogen atoms are fused together. This fusion process creates helium, at helium atoms and releases vast amounts of energy. It is fusion that powers the stars. In theory, scientists realized, it would be possible to recreate this process inside a bomb. Hydrogen could be put inside a fission bomb, like the ones used in Japan. When the fission bombs exploded, the heat and pressure would be great enough to cause the fusion of the hydrogen atoms. The power of such a bomb would have almost no limit. The more hydrogen you add, the bigger the blast. In October 1949, Oppenheimer and other scientific advisors sat down to discuss the hydrogen bomb. Would the bomb really work? Probably, the scientists agreed. Would building it make Americans safer? No, they argued. The United States already had enough bombs powerful enough to wipe out Soviet cities. Building even bigger bombs would only heat up the arms race with the Soviets. The Soviets would respond by building bigger bombs themselves, putting Americans in greater danger. Oppenheimer argued that now was the time to step back from the arms race, not to accelerate it. We believe a super bomb should never be produced, Oppenheimer wrote on behalf of the scientists. Another Los Alamos leader, 
Hans Baith added his own argument. I believe the most important question is the moral one, he said. Can we, who have always insisted on morality and human decency between nations, as well as inside our own country, introduce this weapon of total annihilation into the world? President Truman saw it differently. The Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin was proving to be ruthless and untrustworthy. It would be dangerous, even irresponsible, Truman figured, to let the Soviets become more powerful than the United States. And as always, there was a political angle. If the Soviets got the hydrogen bomb first, American voters might blame the president who let it happen. When it came time to make the decision, Truman had one question about the hydrogen bomb. Can the Russians do it? Yes, said his advisors. In that case, we have no choice. We'll go ahead. On January 31st, 1950, Truman announced that the country was moving forward with work on the hydrogen bomb. We keep saying we have no other course, lamented Truman's advisor, David Lilienthal. What we should be saying is, we are not bright enough to see any other course. Albert Einstein, who had first alerted President Roosevelt to the possibility of building atomic bombs, was deeply disturbed. If successful, he said, radioactive poisoning of the atmosphere and hence annihilation of any life on Earth has been brought within range of technical possibilities. On November 1, 1952, on a tiny island in the South Pacific, the United States tested the world's first hydrogen bomb. It exploded with the incredible force of 10 megatons of TNT. That's 10 million tons of TNT, more than 500 times more powerful than the bomb that flattened Hiroshima. Less than a year later, in Kazakhstan, the Soviets successfully tested their first hydrogen bomb. From this point on, there could be no such thing as winning a nuclear war. We may be likened to two scorpions in a bottle, Oppenheimer wrote in a 1953 article, each capable of killing the other, but only at the risk of his own life. Quotes like this got Oppenheimer into trouble. They particularly annoyed Louis Strauss, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, AEC, the government agency in charge of the country's atomic energy policy. Strauss argued that Oppenheimer's opposition to the H-bomb was an act of disloyalty to America. He suggested that maybe Oppenheimer had always been disloyal. As evidence, he dug up those flimsy charges the Army and the FBI had investigated ten years before, that Oppenheimer was secretly a communist and maybe even a Soviet spy. Strauss has devised a plan for taking Oppenheimer down. He'd have the AEC strip Oppenheimer of his security clearance. Without this clearance, Oppenheimer would no longer be allowed to see secret information on the latest atomic weapons research. He couldn't advise the government because he wouldn't know what was going on. Oppenheimer had two options, demand a hearing or simply walk away. He knew by, by now that nothing he did or said could stop the arms race. But there was a principle involved. He couldn't let the charges against him go unchallenged. This course of action, he told Strauss, would mean that I accept and concur in the view that I am not fit to serve this government and that I have now served for some 12 years. This I cannot do. Oppenheimer got his hearing, but it was bogus from the start. Strauss personally picked the panel of judges. The FBI tapped Oppenheimer's phones and listened in on conversations between him and his attorney. This illegally gathered information was used against Oppenheimer in court. Strauss and his lead lawyer, Robert Ra Roger Robb, came up with two main lines of attack. First, they argued that Oppenheimer objected to the hydrogen bomb and therefore was helping to weaken America. Secondly, that Oppenheimer had never come clean about the so-called Chavalier incident. This was the time in late 1942 when Oppenheimer's friend, Hakon Chevalier, had come to his house and mentioned that a Soviet agent he knew would be interested in any scientific information Oppenheimer might like to share. Oppenheimer had hashed it all out with Army security officers back in 1943, but now Rob suggested that Oppenheimer had never told the whole truth about the Chevalier incident. If the incident had really been so innocent, Rob asked, why hadn't Oppenheimer reported it to Leslie Groves right away? Rob was clearly implying that Oppenheimer had closer contact with the Soviets than he was admitting. The judges were swayed. 
they voted to revoke Oppenheimer's security clearance. Dr. Oppenheimer, entitled to the continued confidence of the government, declared the AEC. Oppenheimer was only 50 years old, but friends said he suddenly looked older. I think it broke his spirit, really, Robert Serber said of the ruling. I think to a certain extent, it actually almost killed him, spiritually, agreed Isidore Rabi. It achieved what his opponents wanted to achieve. It destroyed him. During the hearing, a friend mentioned that Oppenheimer, with his scientific reputation, would be welcome at any top university in Europe. Why not go? Tears glazed Oppenheimer's eyes as he said, Damn it, I happen to love this country. Even after the hearing, the FBI continued listening in on Oppenheimer's phone calls. When he and his family flew to the Caribbean, Caribbean island of St. John for a vacation, agents kept watch. According to the plan, declared one FBI report, Oppenheimer will first travel to England, from England he will travel to France, and while in France, he will vanish into Soviet hands. Actually, Oppenheimer sat on the beach for a few weeks, then he went home to New Jersey. He continued working in Princeton until his retirement in 1966. That same year, he was diagnosed with cancer of the throat. He died in 1967, at the age of 62. All the while, the arms race expanded. In 1954, the United States tested a massive 15-megaton hydrogen bomb on the tiny Pacific island of Bikini Atoll. A cloud of radioactive dust spread over 7,000 square miles of ocean. To this day, the radioactive soil of Bikini Atoll makes the island uninhabitable. Soviet bomb makers responded with the biggest atomic explosion in history, an incredible 50-megaton monster. The test knocked down brick buildings 25 miles from the blast. The shockwave cracked windows 500 miles away. Other countries decided they needed the bomb as well. Great Britain tested its first atomic bomb in 1952. France followed with its first bomb test in 1960. Then came China in 1964 and India in 1974. The United States and Soviet Union continued racing. The race was no longer to build bigger bombs. The bombs were already too big for any possible target. The race was to build more bombs and faster and more accurate ways to deliver them by airplane, submarine, and missile. By the mid-1980s, the two sides had a total of 65,000 nuclear bombs. Each side could now destroy the other's cities within minutes of the start of war. The rivals had enough bombs to destroy all human life many times over. The world has since stepped back a bit from this cliff. In the late 1980s, the United States and USSR began negotiating treaties to reduce the number of atomic weapons. The reductions have continued since the end of the Cold War. Together, the United States and Russia now have about 22,000 atomic bombs. But other countries have joined the nuclear club. Pakistan tested a uranium fission bomb in 1998. North Korea has had the bomb since 2006. Israel may have had about 80 atomic bombs, though it will not officially confirm or deny its bomb program. In 2011, the United, State, United Nations inspectors announced that they had found evidence that Iran was very likely working, in secret, to build its own atomic arsenal. The big question is, will any of these bombs ever be used? Most of the world's atomic bombs are still in the hands of the United States and Russia. And while our two countries are not exactly friendly, Tensions are far lower than they were during the Cold War. For now, at least, it's hard to imagine a realistic series of events that could lead to a massive exchange of atomic bombs. But other dangers exist. One is the nightmare scenario of a terrorist group getting hold of an atomic weapon. Another is that an actual government, like the secretive rulers of North Korea, might just be crazy enough to lash out with atomic bombs. Or longtime enemies, India and Pakistan, could go to war. As they, have had, as they have several times, and this time, the shooting could escalate into a nuclear battle. And if you think atomic explosions in Asia wouldn't affect Americans, consider this. A study published in Scientific American in 2010 looked at the probable impact of a small nuclear war, one in which India and Pakistan each dropped 50 atomic bombs. The scientists concluded that the explosions would ignite massive firestorms 
sending enormous amounts of dust and smoke into the atmosphere. This would block out some of the sun's light from reaching the Earth, making the planet colder and darker for about 10 years. Farming would collapse, and people all over the globe would starve to death. And that's if only half of 1% of all the atomic bombs on Earth were used. In the end, this is a difficult story to sum up. The making of the atomic bomb is one of history's most amazing examples of teamwork and genius and poise under pressure. But it's also the story of how humans created a weapon capable of wiping our species off the planet. It's a story with no end in sight. And like it or not, you're in it. And that is the end of the book. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to shoot me some messages down in the comments. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. If there's a book you would like to hear, let me know. Uh, until then, I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.